I was looking to start DMing a new campaign, so I started looking through LFG groups on multiple platforms to see if anybody was in need. I find a post for a group of friends looking for someone to DM a game. Judging from what was posted, the vibe felt okay, so I sent a message. The person replied, we talked in Discord a bit, everything was going well, I set up a Discord for the campaign, sent him the invite, and told him to get everyone else in so we can start talking and have a session zero. He tells me he'll let everyone know and we schedule a day and time for session zero. He's the only one that shows up, and he tells me he's at a wine tasting, so we'll have to be quick. He's very distracted throughout the call. I try and power through, discuss expectations of the game, character creation, etc. I tell him everyone else still needs to join the Discord so we can go through character creation and backstories. He tells me he'll take care of it. I set a firm date for the campaign to start in hopes they will get everybody in gear. Um, it does not. One other person joins the Discord, then both players send me character sheets that did not match the character parameters I had set, and their backstories were wildly different from the setting. They clearly had a different game in mind other than what was discussed. At this point, I'd had enough. I messaged the original person that this is not going to work, blocked them, closed the Discord, and called a day. Fortunately, I put together another group, and we've been going for about one and a half years. Might be a hot take, but I think showing up while you're at a wine tasting event might be worse than just not showing up at all. I'd rather have no game than a bad game where everybody is distracted and not paying attention to what's going on. Rule set was 3.5, and I was typically the DM, and my group were all power gamers. They love roleplay too, so it was a powerful group with in-depth backstory that got into pretty long-term party objectives. Challenging encounters too, they fled and regrouped probably one-fourth of the time, and character roleplay as well. Open world, never did any modules, and I rarely spent more than a few minutes planning an adventure because there is a very low chance they would take that bait. Instead, I would plan major world events the players would engage in. Now, enter our new guy. He had never played in our group. He wanted to dungeon master. He wanted to dungeon master this group with their current characters and wanted to run a module that he loved. I told him that it is a bad idea for this group and these characters, but the party is willing to re-roll some new tunes for a one-shot to see if you would fit in. Honestly, I was excited because I've been DMing for six years and wanted to roll up a mystic, but he insisted. I told him to ramp up the levels of the monsters by four and max their HP. He said, if it's not in the module, it's not in the session. I knew. It was not going to go well, and told him immediately that the group was frankly OP and experienced DMs would have a hard time making the combat challenging and not TPK them, so you have to do some tweaking. He ignored me. Anyway, we... we start. The module is pretty good. It's about going and collecting a body of a prince that has fallen in combat for a proper funeral. First combat was four ogres, and a troll. The party finished them off quickly with no hit points taken. The rogue killed the troll round one solo, two weapon fighting and all the feats to give additional attacks, short sword of quitness, dagger of flame, sneak attack 46 per attack. Second encounter was about the same, two lizard uh, things. They died just as quickly. The DM was upset and skipped the next battle on purpose as announcing that there was no point in the next battle. So we get to the castle where we are to collect the body from the enemy and they ambushed us. But there is no combat. The narrative goes something like this. The four guards come out and arrest you all for being aligned with X thing. They take your stuff and throw you into jail cells. The group is stunned. The rogue says that no way he would allow himself to be taken like that. We need to rewind and just do a combat. The DM says the group have just killed the guards. It's not part of the story. The group has to escape now. The DM says all of our stuff is gone and we only have our clothes and we don't have a chance to escape for six months. So the group is pissed, and Chris, who plays a dwarven cleric, which 10 levels later would become an evil necromancer, and the party would end the campaign with an epic battle with him, tell the DM it's not how we play the game, and he can rewind or he can leave. It was Chris's house we were playing at, too. The DM said, fine, everyone is executed at dawn, and your characters are dead. Then he legit said to give him the character sheets. Obviously, we didn't give him our character sheets. He left and was not invited back. Very peculiar overall we never let anyone else dm again that didn't spend four or five sessions in the group as a player 
That is a pretty good rule of thumb. I know it said a lot that kind of loses its meaning, but don't forget this. It really is true. Every D&D group is different. Some people play D&D so vastly different from myself, I doubt we're playing the same game. It is a completely different world in some tables, and that's okay. That's great. Every table should be different. Variety is spicy, after all, and that's why we play this game. Often it's because we can do our own thing. And that means that when you're trying to guess DM, you don't know what you're getting into, which is why it's a good rule of thumb to stick around for a little bit to figure out the tone of the game. However, I don't think this is just a problem of a DM who doesn't understand the group. I think this is also a problem of the DM just not being very good at their job. The railroaded guard thing is just, yeah, not gonna fly in the vast majority of groups that I've both DM'd and played and just, no. In 2020, I ran Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, which may also be my last time being a game master. This granted me a huge sense of paranoia. My game was incredibly popular because the listings on Roll20 was for all paid GMs a week before, and I was the only free listing. I had over 140 applicants due to everyone being home for COVID lockdown and sorted through 200 DMs until what I believed were to be the perfect applicants. Drin, half-elf, drow, friends with problem player, revealed to be metagaming too. Bastion, wolf tribesman barbarian, friend of mine who has six years of game master experience. Zintha, the satyr druid, nice girl. Melvin, gnome and then ASMR problem player. Coslin, the ASMR eldritch knight who was also revealed to be metagaming in private voice chat after sessions with Melvin. To start from the beginning, I had styled it to recite the Icewind Dale poem of the Frost Maiden as a prelude just as a charming way of opening before introductions to which Melvin mysteriously replied, obviously fully knowing what the poem actually does, you do know you have the Icewind Dale poem on the screen, right? After the first session, I asked Melvin what he meant by that and asked if he had played Rhyme of the Frost Maiden before or have been reading ahead. Drim, whom I had no idea was friends with Melvin, stepped in to defend him and said, oh, uh, no, he just meant he thought the document was important. Right. For a bit more context, I specifically said before the first session, I want you to play a character you're passionate about rather than what you think the party needs and grant yourself a purpose to permanently glue yourself to the party. Lo and behold, after session three, Melvin asks to switch to a female ASMR paladin from his gnome rogue, to which I ask, why? He goes into a rant about how his character feels like he would abandon the party and that he's bored of playing a rogue and then asked to occasionally switch between the two instead. I had of course said no to him switching and reminded him it was his responsibility to play a character he loved rather than whatever this is. But I did grant his wish to switch to Paladin this one time. He became the most obnoxious loud Paladin who made a point to speak over those she disagreed with, who then asked to start a love story with Drin too. Three of the other players had messaged me saying how uncomfortable they were with Melvin directing the plot however he wanted, as well as Melvin attempting to tell Zinthi how to perform her turns. You need to heal Drin. Don't use your short bow, use your cantrip. Don't you have Moonbeam? Of course, this was all part of his character. Things finally hit ahead when we entered a kobold-filled cave. I had felt unarmed kobolds were too weak for a level 4 party and decided to place two animated armors in a part of the mine. When the party encountered them, Melvin finally dropped his facade and revealed to everyone, GM, those aren't supposed to be here. Everyone grew quiet before I promptly kicked Melvin out of the Discord, out of the Roll20 game, and out of my hair before Drin decided to join him. Coslin, another one of their buddies, feeling guilty, revealed that after the second session, Melvin invited Drin and Coslin to a Discord call where they read through the entire module together and made plans as to what to do to face it as a group. Melvin then messages Bastion, my friend, saying he had fun playing with him and he felt that he wasn't cheating because he was only revealing what they've been through so far. A lie Coslin quickly told me about, to which I exposed him with screenshots of their group DMs before he blocked Coslin and faded into obscurity yet again. I don't know why people feel the need to cheat like this, even so obviously. All in all, I lost my passion for it about a year after that before continuing as a player, forever paranoid. I think I still am a little paranoid to this day, but I am hopeful for my future in tabletop. I know cheating might not seem very harmful 
at the surface level, but it is a serious problem, especially in a game where you're supposed to be playing together. First and foremost, your DM is trying to create and balance this around you and your players. Your DM is probably working really hard to do so. So when you cheat, it really tosses out the balance and it is incredibly dishonest and rude in general. It makes your DM feel like they are just simply not respected. It's just not a great feeling. It can also be spotlight hoggy. If you already know everything that's going to happen, it allows you to take advantage of that and leave the other players in the dust. It's just not really fun. This is just some of the most annoying cheating to me. I mean, fudging rolls, that's one thing, but looking ahead in the story, spoiling things for yourself and even for other players because this guy invited other people too. It just, it just really, really sucks. The DM, it would really break my heart if I found out that my players had read ahead of my story and already knew everything. Like, it would really ruin a lot of the fun for me. I do hope one day our OP can get back into DMing because it's one of my favorite things to do and it just really sucks when stuff like this ruins the experience. I've been addicted to this Reddit for a few days now and have decided to post a horror story from one of my few stints as a game master. Warning, terrible writing skills, and content warning if you hate torture? TLDR at the bottom. I'll start by introducing the cast of this edgy tale. Myself as an elf warrior styled after Link from Zelda, I was taking a stint at GMing this week as the normal GM was busy with work. Donnie, an unashamed furry who plays an anthro wolf man, the type of guy who forces a belch to seem macho. He insists on a crowbar being his weapon in every single game. Dallas, edgelord supreme, overall that guy. He is the reason slash problem child for this horror story. His character is a half human, half demon, and when he isn't brooding in the corner, he is most certainly complaining about his obligatory traumatic past. He is playing a rogue, of course, that uses exclusively throwing knives. Sam, our normal game master, was busy at his job this week, so I volunteered to take his place since I had been wanting to do this for a while. I took a good solid night coming up with the quest and the details for the session, and on the day of the session, I was ready and I was eager. I had the players start out in their obligatory tavern and introduce the standard messenger to recruit for the quest. There was a town that had been grinding up adventurers like hamburger meat, and several of the families had pooled money together to send someone to investigate. Dallas, our problem player, and Donnie were both eager to investigate and earn the reward, since it was a substantial sum. I believe it was 500 gold? So they quickly accepted and went off to the town. When they arrived, they were greeted eagerly, and the villagers even threw a feast for them. They thought it was strange, but essentially the villagers' overall tone was, We haven't had any adventurers in a decade or so, and we are so excited to have some finally come to help us with our problems. They quickly noticed something weird about the mayor. He was basically a copy of the one from the Powerpuff Girls, but they were enjoying the roleplay from the feast. Long story short, Donnie ended up in a barn with two local women, and Dallas, our problem player, was naturally holed up in the local inn brooding. In the middle of the night, they were greeted by a large scratching and screeching sound and quickly discovered it was a massive horde of rats. Think Vermintide. So Dallas just barred the door and waited while Donnie fought off the women who he had boinked the night before. What, did they all turn into rats? Well, that's not so bad. Dawn comes and everything is normal. They realize the villagers must be cursed. Thinking that the mayor may have answers, they go after him and intimidate him after they fail some persuasion checks. He quickly speaks up since Donnie's intimidation stat is high and Donnie leaves to go find the witch that cursed the town folk. Edgelord Dallas, however, decides something different. He smacks the mayor in the face and hog ties him. I warn Dallas saying, you can already tell he doesn't know anything else. There's no need for this. And he says, I think he knows more, and I have no mercy for cowards. And then he proceeds to say, I jam my knife under his fingernails and rip him off. Donnie was laughing at the description of the babbling and sobbing mayor, but he sort of stops and goes quiet at this point. Dude, just, just stop. You're, you're wasting time. Dallas gets mad and insists I let him roll for intimidation. I tell him, the check would be like a one, since he's on the verge of pissing his pants. So Donnie decides in a Dragon Age universe, which includes some very aggressive and murdery Templar holy men, to unveil his demon side in an attempt to scare this mayor even further. At this point, I decide I'm going to dig the hole deeper for him since I've grown tired of his constant edgelord brooding BS and was hoping he would derp his way into a dead character. Okay, Dallas, my character, Donnie's character, and the mayor's secretary, including the mayor, all see you are a demon. The secretary shrieks loudly, calling for help, and the mayor pisses himself. My character is red in the face and draws his weapon, ordering you to stop. 
Donnie says that his character shakes his head and walks out the door. Dallas then starts to throw a fit about why my character has drawn a weapon. He questions why I'm being so soft, and he says something along the lines of, Sam wouldn't care, you're being a I realize that Sam, our previous GM, would indeed care, and so I hatch a plan to kill this character. I know this is malicious and over the line, but I was seeing red at this point, and I was a green GM. I decide I'm going to essentially lay a course for him to be captured and executed for what he did. Only thing is, I'll give him five chances to get out of this untouched. He does seem to accept this reasoning. I give him a chance to pass a persuasion check. He refuses and demands a trial, saying he did nothing wrong and saved the town. I give him a chance to escape his binds while also being transported to the court. He refuses, for some reason. I give him a chance to be represented by our old GM, Sam. He had just gotten off of work and joined in. His character has very high persuasion and charisma stats. He refuses again. He chooses to represent himself and makes a nat one on his opening statement. And being in medieval court, the shivering and sobbing mayor on the witness stand essentially ensures he gets a guilty verdict. Finally, the last chance I give him, I tell him to try and attack the guards before they disable his magic. If he can stun them, he could run away to survive. I felt bad about maybe killing him and was going to intentionally give him an escape. He refuses again and says that they won't hang him. He did nothing wrong, he insists. At this point, Donnie and Sam are just dying laughing and Dallas doesn't really seem worried. They lead him to the block a la Skyrim intro and he looks out and says, Sam, Donnie, hurry up and get me down from here. And they shake their heads. Dallas goes quiet and the executioner easily laughs and removes his demon head. The chat goes quiet and Dallas just leaves the room. Sam tells me that he's getting private message by Dallas telling him that I'm a bitch for doing it and that he didn't do anything wrong. Thankfully, Sam made sure his character stayed dead and Dallas made a less edgy twin brother of his last one. I felt bad, but I think he relaxed on the torture porn after that. I guess this was lacking in the overall horror, but I essentially got super tired of the constant torture and slaughter and general murder hobo edginess. Thank you for reading. I didn't expect this to be so long. I appreciate your time. TLDR, my first time really GMing an edgy that guy murder hobo tortures the hell out of the mayor from the Powerpuff Girls and then is brutally executed for his trouble. I don't mean any offense by this, but when the OP says this was my first time GMing, I can kind of tell. There's a lot of new GM mistakes here. Letting a situation go too far is the first one. Look, you don't solve out of game problems with in game consequences. The problem is that we have an edgelord murder hobo torture dude who is ruining the game, who is disrupting the game at the very least. That's not gonna get better if you just kill their character. That's probably just gonna tick them off and if anything, make them do the thing they were already doing more. Look, does it make for a good story that you killed off the problem player's character? Sure, yeah, but it doesn't actually solve anything. You know what's more fun than getting revenge on your problem player? Playing a good D&D game. And doing this is not going to ensure that your D&D game is fun in the long term. Take them aside after the game and just tell them and explain to them what's going on. And if they really, really don't want to change their behavior and it's really disrupting the game, then ask them to step away from the game instead, because that is the simplest and easiest solution to this problem. Killing off their character? Not a solution in any way. I'm not really blaming the OP at the same time though, because your first time GMing is going to be stressful, and if that first time GMing is also combined with a problem player, then ugh, it's just a rough combination, trust me I know. What really matters is learning from those mistakes and becoming a better GM and hopefully player on the side of Dallas in the future of your D&D career. About a year and a few months ago, I reconnected with a group of friends and they allowed me to join their campaign. Everything seemed fine. In fact, there weren't any present issues that I picked up on. Every now and again, I would notice what looked like special treatment to one of the girl players, but then I would brush it off and we'd move on like it was nothing. Again, seemed fine at first. Our problem DM, PDM, ran a text-based D&D game and preferred story over combat, so much of that, myself and a close friend began wondering, why the hell did we even pick melee characters and take all these feats for fighting? But that wasn't even where the real problem festered in the game. The man was so determined to convince us that one, his NPCs were the heroes and not us, and two, the girls, three of them in the campaign, could have all the content they wanted while us guys were kind of left in the dust with minimum effort and content for our characters. Between quests, we had downtime to chat with NPCs, learn what made them tick, develop our own player characters in a social setting, all that fun stuff, and even joke around with said NPCs. 
unfortunately, whenever we want to do character-specific stuff, to which we usually work out with the problem player DM, the guys in the group would barely get anything worthwhile, my character could barely talk to his love interest without it being deflected into what his NPCs wanted, or my buddy wanted to talk to his long-lost daughter, but the problem DM wanted to instead force that NPC's poly relationship in his face with no regard to what the player wanted to pursue. On a side note, it was a little awkward since my friend was playing the dad and the problem DM was writing out pretty explicit stuff involving the daughter. And yeah, she was an adult during the writing, but it was still felt, felt awkward. Now, when the girls in the group wanted downtime, the problem DM had loads of content for them. Their love interests were always available to talk and continue whatever side quest they were on. The NPCs they wanted to talk to, if they weren't involved, were just now involved in the main story and simply gives us pertinent information. They can re-roll charisma checks. The problem DM rolls his dice off screen for them specifically, when instead rolls using the Discord bot for the guys in the group. We immediately picked up on the fudge rolls on the side of nepotism. It had gotten to the point of him being plain obvious about it when I attempted a run in a fight to get my character a glorious death as an excuse to just cut him out of the game. I secretly texted the girl to run away from the fight that had already looked too hard for us to handle, and when she attempted to do so, the DM straight told her in front of us that if she goes for two more rounds, it'll be over. When the two rounds were over, he had to redo some math off screen, and he comes back with, she killed him by one extra point, and then tries to say without any prompting that, I didn't uh, fudge those rolls, guys. Dude, no one asked, which makes it even more suspicious. This was one of the many instances where the guys in the group were left out with crumbs worth of story, lore, content, and even just plain interaction. He would go out of his way to insult us for how we played our characters, but defend the girls for how they played, even when we were trying to constructively critique one another in our own out-of-game chat. Mind you, there were five other guys in this group that had been playing with him for years, who eventually left as well because they had a great time until these girls showed up and the problem DM began white knighting and, for lack of a better term, simping for them. We also theorized he self-inserted himself into all his NPCs because every single one of them had the same personality, and we all just collectively agreed on that. TLDR, the girl players could do no wrong and receive the treatment of queens while the guys got scraps for content and made the mistake of not being simpable. So yeah, the simping thing sucks. Uh, yeah, don't do that. I don't know what else to say on the matter. So we're instead going to talk about something else. General favoritism is something that comes up in D&D. A lot of DMs will do this unintentionally. Sometimes when you're playing in a D&D &D group and you're running for players, some players will give you more to work with. And that will result in you sometimes coming off as favoriting one player over another. Now, for some DMs, this is obvious. Oh, if someone gives me more to work with, I'm going to work with them more. If you don't give me much to work with, that's on you. And I understand that. However, I will contend that if somebody's not giving you much content to work with, it might not be out of just laziness. If it is out of laziness, that's a whole other conversation. But it could be out of inexperience or lack of knowledge about the world that you're playing in. As a DM, I would insist that you should help players if they're not engaging as much. It's something that I do a lot. A lot of my players are new, and therefore, they have trouble interacting with the world, building their characters around it, so I will step in to help them out. And it has resulted in some of the best roleplay in our games. I mean, I don't think that advice could help out this DM because, yeah, this is a favoritism of an entirely different kind, but uh, there's not much for me to talk about on that matter, so we're just gonna move on. And that is going to be it for today's episode of RPG Horror Stories. If you guys enjoyed it, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of my content, then you can check out Tabletop Tavern Tips, the series where I give advice to both DMs and players, old and new. It's linked in the cards. And while you're there in the cards, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern, get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down to the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment, the dreaded guest, to let me know you made it to the end of the video. In essence, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.